inviting me to speak to you all. Oh, okay. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you all this evening. So I'm going to be talking to you about running a nature friendly business with wildflower meadows. Um, as Nick suggested, my business is based here in Midlothian where I um, grow and create my wildflower meadows. So I'm going to be talking to you about my business, the products that I make, probably the most interesting bit is about the meadow, um, then some of the lessons that I've learned and what I hope to do next. So first of all, the business itself. I wanted to start by saying that my background is absolutely not um, in wildflower meadows. So um, I've had an absolutely brilliant, exciting career um, to date. Most recently, I was working at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. Um, I did my PhD on epiphytes of temperate rainforests, and that's something that I'm still really passionate about. Absolutely love woodland ecology, um, but here in um, Midlothian, East Lothian, we don't have that much woodland. Um, so how did I get to working on wildflower meadows? Well, um, after I had a baby, I was obviously on maternity leave, but I didn't feel ready to go back to work at the end of maternity leave. And the botanic gardens were absolutely brilliant and offered me a career break. And at that time, a friend who lived locally on a small holding was wanting to create a wildflower meadow on a patch of her land. And um, she asked me if I would consider helping her to do that. So we created this wildflower meadow and I was amazed at how quickly this patch of land went from bare earth to this absolutely beautiful meadow bursting with life. Um, and I just thought in a short space of time while I'm on a career break, there's so much that you can do um, in terms of biodiversity gain with working with wild, wildflower meadows. Um, I also was asked by a local community group to help them create a wildflower meadow. Um, and I just found that there was suddenly so much interest um, in this particular habitat. Um, so it seemed like there was lots of work to do. Now, wildflower seed is, turns out is very expensive. So I needed to fund this work in some way. Most people would of course look to charities or perhaps a social enterprise um, to fund their work. But at the time there was this program on the BBC, a documentary called Extinction, The Facts, you might've seen it. And on that program, um, Sir Robert Watson, the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, um, was talking about nature conservation and all the things that we needed to change if we really wanted to um, hold the loss of biodiversity. And one of the things he said was that we need the best of the private sector to show that you can make a profit and still conserve nature. And this just, this just gave me an idea and made me think maybe there is an alternative funding structure whereby you're not relying on um, grants and donations, handouts, but you can be a little bit more in control of um, the funding that you're receiving um, for your conservation work. So this is the basic business model that I came up with. I thought if you can create some wildflower meadows, um, from those wildflower meadows, use some of the plants as ingredients to create products, sell those products and use some of those profits to create more wildflower meadows. Um, that's the basic premise of what I'm doing. Um, and I started by creating a wildflower meadow. The initial meadow was just half an acre in size that I began with. I should also say that when I talk about the business, um, I often use the term we and us, um, but it is very much just a small family business. So day to day, um, I run the business, but in the summer months when we're really busy with harvesting and making, I do rope in the rest of the family. So my husband will come and help out. Um, my little girl um, is always around. She's not all that helpful all the time, but it's great to be able to work um, with her alongside. Um, I also rope in my mum and dad and my sister and all the children come up. So it's really lovely. Um, to be working together as a family like that. Next up, the products that I make from the wildflower meadow. So when I was um, starting the business, I was thinking, um, obviously I had to come up with some products. I was thinking about what I was going to sell and I was thinking about the ingredients at my disposal. So within a wildflower meadow, you've got all these um, lovely products that are used um, often in herbal medicines. Um, 
and um, sold in natural products. And then you've also at the moment got this um, trend for natural products. There's such an interest in natural products at the moment. And there's lots of companies out there making an awful lot of money out of natural ingredients and the very idea of nature, um, which, is, which is great in terms of an opportunity, but it's something that's always kind of wound me up slightly. So you can see this bottle um, of the original source the um, tingly mint and tea tree shower gel. And you can see um, it's saying that it's using 100% natural fragrance. So it's very much using the idea of nature, the idea of natural ingredients to sell the product. Um, but then lower down, it says, there are 7,927 real mint leaves in every bottle. And when I see things like this, I just think, how, why is that a good thing? I mean, that's an awful, awful lot of plant matter going into one bottle of shower gel. There's a lot of land being used to create that one bottle of shower gel. I just, I don't understand why that's good with, you know, create, growing all these plants. We're harvesting them often before they're even flowered. So they're not even providing um, a nectar source to, to insects. And then it's going into a single bottle. Why is that a good thing? I don't know. Anyway, um, I might talk a little bit about that later. Um, so I obviously thought I want to somehow work with these um, natural ingredients that are growing within my meadow. How am I going to use them? Well, a lot of the um, properties of um, natural ingredients that we use in the products are plants that smell good and those that have um, therapeutic properties. These um, properties, the aroma and the therapeutic properties often come from the volatile organic compounds within the plants. And we extract these as essential oils. Now the plant is producing these compounds often um, to communicate with other animals or plants to defend themselves from other animals and plants um, and in response to environmental stresses as well. Um, the plant is not obviously producing them because um, they smell good to humans. The fact that lavender, for example, smells good, makes us feel relaxed is just a, a byproduct. That's not why the plant's making um, these products. But I had, um, well, I have a hypothesis that maybe growing plants within a wildflower meadow rather than a mono monoculture would actually give them more to talk about. So they've got more to communicate about, they've got more to defend themselves against, and therefore they'll maybe produce a greater diversity and abundance of these volatile organic compounds. I haven't tested this theory. Um, if anyone's listening, um, who's interested in that idea, uh, I think it'd be just a really interesting little research project to investigate. Um, anyway, moving on. So um, I obviously had the plants growing that grow naturally within a wildflower meadow at my disposal. So I worked with some native plants like wild carrot, wild rose, yarrow, plantain, red clover, they grow wild in the meadow. But I also wanted to work with some more um, traditional, natural ingredients. So I grow within my meadow some plots as well of um, non-native species. These are naturalized species though, so they don't require a lot of input. You can basically just scatter the seed and walk away. Things like Roman chamomile, peppermint and lemon balm. And I grow within these within these plots um, that are set amongst the wildflower meadow. So they've got the back backdrop of the wildflower meadow and all the life that's buzzing around um, in there. Now, when I started to work with these volatile organic compounds, the um, essential oils, you can see that um, bottom right corner, there's a picture of one of the stills that I work with to extract these compounds. Um, what I found was that when you're distilling for essential oils, you're basically distilling for what's called the hydrophobic volatile organic compounds. These are ones that don't like water, they separate off from water, they generally float on top of water. But the yield of these compounds is so incredibly low. So for one kilogram of plant matter that you grow and put in the still, you're going to get around one gram of essential oil. So your yield is about 0.1%. Even for a high yielding plant like peppermint, you're only going to get about 1% yield of essential oil. But for a low yielding plant like lemon balm, you're getting 0.01%. So hardly any essential oil at all. Now, essential oils you obviously don't use at high concentrations. In skincare products, you use them at about 1% concentration. 
But this means that your one kilogram plant matter is basically giving you one bottle of product to sell. Um, it doesn't sound very sustainable way of working with plants to me. The other product that you get when you distill for essential oils are the floral waters. They're also called hydrosols. And in the floral waters, they're really aromatic plant waters. But you basically have um, the hydrophilic um, VOCs. So these are the water loving ones, the ones that dissolve in the water. But you also get the suspended hydrophobic compounds as well. So you get some essential oils within this floral water. And when you work with these floral waters, one kilogram of plant matter will give you one litre of product. And that's enough to make between 10 and 20 bottles of product. And that just seems a much more sustainable way of working with plant matter to me. Um, and when I first found this out, I kind of couldn't believe that we're still so absolutely fixated on essential oils. You know, we're constantly encouraged to use them for all sorts of things and um, for our health, for you see people using them to clean their floors and things. And I just think it's complete madness. And so um, I did a couple of social media posts about it. I wrote a blog and um, it was quite unbelievable. It was almost like the aromatherapy industry had never really thought about this. And I was asked to present at this aromatherapy conference last year, um, which I was quite embarrassed about because I don't know anything about aromatherapy. Um, but I just thought it was important to share these ideas and the aromatherapy sector was really, really interested um, in the sustainability aspects of their products. Um, and I was also interviewed by um, all sorts of people, um, craziness. Anyway, so the products that I make, I use these um, floral waters. I use them to make um, a range of natural skincare products um, and herbal teas as well which I sell at local markets um, and I've got a website as well. And then I use those profits to feed back um, into the nature conservation work that I do. So <clears throat> working in a um, natural skincare industry is fantastic because the market's large and it's growing. So in terms of funding conservation work, there's money to be made in that, this sector, which is great. But what I really love about it is the opportunity to reach out to a new audience and share ideas about the importance of nature conservation with people that wouldn't otherwise necessarily be thinking about it. So just the other week, I um, managed to get a stall in John Lewis of all places in Edinburgh. So I set up my stall um, and you have people coming in the shop quite innocently, just looking for a bottle of face cream. And, um, you know, I'd lure them over to my stall, come and have a look at my creams. And then you can tell them all about wildflower meadows and all the biodiversity they support um, and why um, it's so important that we conserve them. So it's been fantastic to um, share these ideas with new audiences that I wouldn't otherwise um, have been able to meet. The other thing that I did when I set up the business was um, associate myself with a certification scheme. And when I first set up the business, um, another skincare company said to me that how important it was to be, um, associate yourself with a certification scheme, because that's what customers see. If they just take one thing away from your brand, it will be your certification, i.e. organic, natural, whatever it is. And when I started looking at these certifications for natural skincare companies, so a lot of um, companies go for organic certification or natural certification, um, plastic-free, preservative-free, or other ones that's becoming more common. I think a lot of people, um, consumers will buy products that have these certifications, not necessarily because they're better for the environment, even though they often are, but they're really buying them because they want something that's better for them, better for human health. And what I wanted to do was to show that okay, my products, they might be better for your health, but that's not why we're making them. This is all about doing something good for the environment, doing something good for wildlife. And I found this wildlife friendly certification from the Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network um, that I thought, perfect, that's exactly what I want to um, associate myself with. Um, at the time though, they were only working with um, brands that were conserving really charismatic species, things like wolves and snow leopards, um, bears, elephants. Um, whereas I, of course, was working with wildflower meadows and um, little insects, um, which were maybe not quite so um, in, impressive in some ways. But anyway, I got in touch with them and said, hey, what about um, 
you know, the invertebrates. And um, we worked together and came up with a certification scheme for pollinators, which is brilliant. And then I was able to get that certification for my product. So I um, was really pleased about that. It has been such a steep learning curve. Um, I don't didn't have a clue about business. Um, I'm not sure I do still really. Um, I had to learn about sales strategies, marketing strategies, had to do all my own social media, PR, think about financial plans. Um, there's so much to think about. Um, but what I've really, really loved about doing this is getting stuck into some real practical conservation because for so long, I've been um, thinking about conservation. Um, it's been a lot of conservation theory, but I've not been able to actually get out there and do the conservation work um, myself. Um, the organizations that I was working for obviously did, but I didn't personally do it. So I've absolutely loved um, getting stuck in in that way. Um, and I've also obviously learned an awful lot about wildflower meadows. So um, the meadow itself, the main meadow that I've created, um, this is just a map showing the location of the meadow. I hope you can see my arrow. The meadow is located here um, in Midlothian. It's just outside Pathhead. Sally, not far from oh yeah, Edinburgh. here we yes. go. The, the, map, the map's appeared now. Yeah, just there was a bit of yeah. delay. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you can see um, the little heart that I'm circling there that shows the location of the, the meadow. And it's just on the border between Midlothian and East Lothian. So the landscape of um, Midlothian and inland East Lothian, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, is um, very, very um, intensively farmed arable land. You can see um, these areas um, are very typical of the landscape. So large fields, um, lots and lots of um, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides are applied to the land. Um, they're very productive in terms of food, which is, is great. They're just not that good for wildlife. The field boundaries are often very um, thin, often comprising just of fences or um, neglected hedgerows. But what you can see in the center of the map here is um, this much greener area of the Preston Hall estate. <clears throat> the Preston Hall estate is owned by the calendar family. So you've got um, a lovely picture of their family home there. Um, <clears throat> but what was really exciting when I first went to the Preston Hall estate was seeing this area of um, semi-natural grassland. So they own um, the land that runs along the Tyne water. Um, it's a local biodiversity site and they just maintained it as semi-natural grassland and it's got these huge mature um, trees within it. It's kind of um, like a pasture parkland setting, but running down to the water. Um, really exciting habitat within a local context. But not only that, look at these amazing field boundaries. Really, really wide. Um, lots of woodland in there. And these are non-native plantations of conifers. When you go into these strips, they're absolutely hugely exciting. Again, in a local context, I'm talking here. Um, because you don't really see that much of these sorts of habitats um, within the local area. Um, so you've got really mature trees, um, largely oak and ash, Scots pine, um, there's some beech in there as well. They're kept quite open. Um, there's good populations of roe deer <clears throat> in the area, so um, they're nice and light. There's lots of dead wood in there that isn't taken away, so fantastic for lots of invertebrates. Um, there's also this area of um, coppiced rowan in there. I've not come across coppiced rowan before. Quite unusual. Um, but anyway, absolutely fantastic habitat that's connecting um, all these areas up um, within, within the local area. So although the arable fields themselves are still really intensively farmed, you've got these fantastic connectivity corridors that run throughout the whole area. The other exciting thing um, about citing my meadow here is that the um, family have just invested a lot of money in converting some of the farm buildings into workshops for local businesses. So um, there's a steadying conversion where you've got lots of local businesses. I've got a little workshop here, but um, also there's um, facilities, kitchens, toilets, that sort of thing. So it's a place that you can bring people, you can run workshops here. I can invite people to come here and learn about wildflower meadows. 
um, which is just fantastic. <clears throat> So this is the um, land that I rented from the landowner um, in year one. And usually when you begin a wildflower meadow, the best practice is to take the land um, and through a growing season, let any seeds within the seed bank establish, germinate. You then kill those off and then you'd sow your wildflower seed. Because this land has been so hammered with herbicides um, I wasn't sure that was entirely necessary so I took a bit of a chance and I just after the farmer had um, uh, taken his harvest um, at the end of the summer I just asked him to cultivate the land and I sowed my wildflower seeds straight into that um, and in year one this is a picture in year one in the summertime you can see loads of annual species germinated so lots of cornflowers came through corn marigolds poppies um, also lots of oxide daisies. Um, the sward was really quite patchy, so the areas um, are very dense growth. There were some areas of absolute bare soil. Um, I think part of it was because of the way the land was managed previously, so some parts of the soil were heavily compacted where it had been tracked over more, um, but also I hand broadcasted the seeds um, on a bit of a windy day. So I think that contributed to it um, as well. But I mean, I think that's great because it, it's kind of created this really interesting mosaic of um, habitats within um, the meadow. Um, but in year two, absolutely beautiful. All the perennials came into flower. Um, again, the meadow seems to be comprised of this really interesting patchwork of mosaics of um, wildflower um, communities within this one meadow um, and you can see in the winter why that might be because you get um, small areas where water holds in the meadow for example um, where you get snow coat cover li lying for longer um, areas that dry out much quicker where the um, it's very heavy clay soil the clay, clay will crack things like this so you can see why these um, mosaic patches are developing um, in the meadow and it's really, really exciting to see. And I can't wait to see what happens to it next year. Um, this is just a um, time-lapse video of us um, out in at the end of the year, um, cutting the meadow back. So in terms of meadow management, one of the most important things you can do is cut back the meadow um, after it's finished flowering. Um, and the idea is that you don't want nutrients to build up in your meadow because that's when invasive species, your tusky grasslands, for example, can start taking over. So we've got a tradition, traditional um, Austrian scythe, um, which we use, um, we go around the whole meadow, cut the whole thing back and rake off the arisings, which we then compost. So you can see um, on the right there, there's just a couple of pictures of me with the scythe. But on the left, um, is a picture of some Tusky grassland. Now, this is a strip of land that is adjacent to the wildflower meadow, the bit of land that I rent. And um, I also rent this bit of land from the farm, but I don't do anything with it. It's not diverse botanically, it's not very interesting, but I just felt it was really important to maintain an area of Tusky grassland year round, because obviously, with the wildflower meadow, you're creating this fabulous habitat, um, particularly for um, pollinating insects, for your nectar feeding insects um, throughout the summer months. But there are other species that are using it as well, other invertebrate species, small mammals, um, perhaps some amphibians. And when you cut it back um, at the end of the year, I wanted somewhere for those species to go. And okay, um, it's not producing um, any nectar particularly, but that's not the point of this habitat. It's um, a winter, it's a winter cover basically, and the structural habitat for those species to move back into. Now, if you look at um, the Midlothian Biodiversity Action Plan, you'll see that wildflower meadows are a hugely important habitat within a local context. <clears throat> so action point one of their biodiversity action plan is to restore and create flower rich habitats which is great because that's exactly what we're doing. Um, and if you look at the house section, point C is to create an insect pathway, a beeline in Midlothian. And this is a project that Bug Life has been working on. 
Um, and this is just a picture of um, the bee lines within um, Mid Lothian. You can see the, well, Mid and East Lothian and West Lothian. You can see the um, red areas are the bee lines. And the idea is that these are um, kind of highways for pollinating insects. And people are supposed to um, create as much um, wildflower habitats within these areas as possible. You can see the blue dots um, screen on the right. Um, I've added our projects to the Bee Lines um, map. And it's just such a shame that it sits outside of the Bee Line. The whole Preston Hall estate, in fact, sits outside of the Bee Line and that wonderful habitat along the River Tyne in particular. Um, I don't know why the Bee Line heads south along the A68. Um, maybe somebody else knows the answer to that, but it seems such a shame that we can't just um, nudge that um, line slightly north to encompass um, the Preston Hall estate and get this fantastic habitat included in the bee line. Um, I have been in touch with Bug Life about this, um, so um, fingers crossed. I've also been able to do lots of work with community groups. This is something that I've really enjoyed doing. So at Bellhaven Community Garden, they had this really large area of tusky grassland that they wanted to diversify. So we've done a few um, plots of wildflower meadow within the tusky grassland. And the idea is that over time, we'll be able to expand out from these areas. Unfortunately, we started this project pre-COVID, um, so that's been a little bit disruptive um, to the project. Um, I also did some work with Midlothian Hospital. They've got a fantastic garden that visitors to the hospital can use. Um, it's really, really beautiful. It's a fantastic community site, but they were also really keen that the site um, was supporting as much biodiversity as possible. So I worked with them to come up with a biodiversity action plan. I did some work with Climate Action East Lothian, where we ran workshops for the public um, to show them how to create their own wild plant meadows. I worked with Pink Caitlin Primary School, we took the children out, collecting seeds from local wildflowers and created some patches of wildflower meadow within the school grounds as well. And I've also been able to work with lots of private landowners, so people who have the land, but don't necessarily um, have the knowledge to create um, really um, important um, sites for, for wildlife within their land. So it's been great to be able to, um, to do that. I also run lots of workshops, so I invite people out to the wildflower meadow and um, just get to get them to experience wildflower meadows. The people who come out aren't necessarily people who otherwise would um, engage with these habitats. They might not know very much about these habitats. Um, and that's because I often draw them in on the premise of um, talking about natural skincare products. Um, but obviously the ingredients that we're using come from the meadow. So it's a great way to link, um, you know, their everyday life back to nature um, and just share these ideas about nature conservation with them. So the lessons that I've learned, uh, first of all, seasonality. So you cut a wildflower meadow back, let's say um, early October, but through till about May, it's not going to do very much at all. So all the work that we do in terms of harvesting, making products, uh, the workshops that we run, um, a lot of the community work that we done, it's do is all packed into this very short period of time. Also, if there's anyone that um, I want to invite out to the meadow to get on board with what we're doing, um, we literally just have a few months to um, to schedule all that. So it's an, it's a very short season when you're working with wildflower meadows, particularly in Scotland. Another thing I've learned is um, the influence of um, neighboring land uses is, is huge. So um, I've got this existing strip of wildflower meadow, but this year I rented an extra half acre of land from the farmer. Um, this summer, the farmer planted the whole um, field, his bit of the field, with um, a green manure crop. crop. Um, and it's this crop called Phacelia. You might have seen it out in the landscape, beautiful purple flowers. Um, people love them. And they basically add lots of nitrogen back into the soil. And it turns out though that they're um, hugely invasive. 
and um, all the seeds from the facility were blown across into this area of wildflower meadow that I was trying to establish. Um, and they've all seeded themselves into my field. If you walk around the bit of the field that the farmer has maintained, despite the fact that that's where the phacelia was growing, there isn't a single seedling germinating because, of course, that bit of the field is sprayed with herbicides, so they're, they're not able to grow. Um, but I've got loads and loads of these little seedlings amongst my wildflower seeds, which also um, were germinating, obviously um, dormant now. Um, but yeah, that's going to be a bit of a problem. So my plan is, Facelia is actually quite easy to pull by hand. So my plan is actually, A, I'm going to hope for a really hard winter um, and that that might finish some of them off. But alternatively, I'm just going to have to go round um, next summer and hand pull them before they set seed, um, which is going to be quite a lot of work. The other thing I've learned is um, the importance of field boundaries. So again, this is the extra bit of land that I've rented from the um, farmer. And there isn't a fence between my bit of land and the area that the farmer is using. And um, I did have some canes out along the um, boundary of the field. Um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but it's um, I am just trying to show where the boundary should be. But basically, when the farmer was drilling his barley into the field um, a couple of months ago, um, I think he just forgot that um, he was supposed to stop and um, ran over my canes and has just drilled barley into um, the wildflower meadow, uh, which I'd already seeded. Um, but I think this is actually going to be a really interesting experiment because barley is an annual crop. So my plan is next year, I'm just going to have to keep cutting um, this area of the meadow back so the barley doesn't flower and set seed. And so long as I do that, um, because it's an annual, it's not a perennial, it shouldn't be a problem in the future months. But if I'm continually cutting it and the wildflower um, species is there establishing as well, if I rake that off, in year one, I'm going to be really reducing the nutrients in this strip of the wildflower meadow. And it's going to be really interesting to see how that establishes compared to um, its counterpart that I've sown in exactly the same way. So it's actually going to be quite an interesting experiment. Lockdown also um, had a really big impact on a lot of the community work that I was doing. So this is one of the um, patches of wildflower meadow that we'd created in um, the school at Penn Caitland. And <clears throat> throughout the winter months, I've been out um, raking up all the leaves to make sure that um, those nutrients weren't going back into the system. Um, and then, of course, we went back and went down, it went into lockdown quite soon after this. Um, and the council were continuing to maintain school grounds and they didn't realize that these were wildflower areas. So they just mowed over them all spring, all summer. Um, when we finally got back to looking at the meadow, the perennial ryegrass, um, which comprises most of the lawn area around the wildflower meadow, had invaded these wildflower meadows because it couldn't obviously um, tolerate high levels of mowing. Um, what I've done is um, I bought a lot of yellow rattle seed, which I've seeded into um, these areas. I'm hoping that that's going to um, just um, hopefully keep, um, just reduce the amount, reduce the competitiveness of the um, grasses that are growing um, in these areas. So fingers crossed that will work. Um, I don't think I've got time to go through all of these, but um, when I run my um, workshops on wildflower meadows, one of the things that I find um, that's the most important thing to get across to people is for them to be really honest about their objectives when they're starting wildflower meadows, because I think a lot of people think that wildflower meadows look like these images on the left, where you've got these really brightly colored flowers. Um, a lot of these flowers are non-natives. A lot of them are annual species. There aren't very many grasses in there at all. Whereas in reality, a perennial wildflower meadow is much more muted. There's um, a much higher proportion of grasses in the meadow area. And people often, if they do try and establish a wildflower meadow, they might get their annuals coming through in the first year and think, fantastic, this is great. But then second year, um, when those annuals don't um, flower, 
and they're faced with a real perennial meadow, they think it's not worked. They think that something's gone wrong. They think that it's just weeds growing and they give up on it, which is such a shame. Um, and also they, they just don't look quite as exciting. And I think that a lot of people, if they're honest, what they want is something that looks actually quite nice. If it's in their garden, they often want something that looks quite nice. Um, rather than something that is purely for wildlife or biodiversity and they don't care what it looks like. So I think just being really honest about that um, when you're creating a wildflower meadow is one of the absolute keys um, to getting it established. Okay, so <clears throat> what's next? So at the moment, um, if you can see the um, the reddest square at the bottom of the screen here where the heart is, so at the moment, I've just established my meadow um, in the easternmost quarter, third of this field here. But what I'd really like to do is to wildflower meadow this whole entire um, field, um, which would create a really, really fantastic sized wildflower meadow. Um, it would be about eight acres altogether. Um, but the seed for that is going to cost around £8,000 alone, um, which I don't think the profits from my um, products will quite make. So what I'm planning on doing is running a crowdfunding campaign. Um, I don't know if you've heard of crowdfunders, but they're basically a way of raising money, whereby rather than just asking for money, um, as you might do um, in a traditional fundraiser, you basically um, ask for people to give you donations, but in return for an experience um, or a product. So in my case, I can um, ask people for donations in return for a place on a workshop um, or potentially um, some products, something like this. So I'm thinking of running a crowdfunding campaign um, to raise the funds to do this. But I've also been talking to lots of local businesses. And I think with COP26, a lot of local businesses are really, really interested in supporting um, a project that would have such a positive impact um, on local biodiversity. Obviously, wildflower meadows are a fantastic nature-based solution to climate change. They sink um, more carbon than um, tree planting scheme would in its initial years. Um, but I can't, I can't sell carbon credits, obviously, but I think a lot of local businesses are just really interested in doing something positive um, for local biodiversity. And it's obviously great in terms of their marketing as well. They can probably generate more sales by associating themselves um, with a really positive um, story. So um, that's what I'm hoping to do. So phase one would be to create this huge wildflower meadow here. Um, if I raised enough, I'd also love to work, um, do some work in the local biodiversity site. Um, to diversify some of this semi-natural grassland. Um, it seems the landowner is quite open to this as well, which is really exciting. Um, there's a lady doing some fantastic work um, along the Tyne Water in an area of semi-natural grassland further to the south, and it'd be great to link up with that. And then wouldn't it just be fantastic icing on the cake to um, put a strip of wildflower meadow in the area that I've um, got labelled as phase three, wouldn't it be brilliant to get a strip of wildflower meadow in there and connect the whole thing up? That'd be hugely exciting. Um, <clears throat> I've been speaking to some local, not local, some conservation agencies um, about this idea um, and they're really, really supportive um, of the crowdfunding campaign, um, which is just great. And um, also, talking to local businesses, it's really interesting what comes up. Um, there seem to be so many opportunities for um, potential projects in the local area. So I was talking to, um, I went out to the um, Bilston Glen Industrial Estate and I was talking to some businesses about my ideas there. And um, one of them told me that they owned some land um, down in Bilston Glen. Um, quite a significant amount of, land, of land that actually links up the two patches of Triple SI, the ancient woodlands. Um, and they were just quite casually saying, oh, do you think you could do something um, something down there? And I went for a walk around the site and it's a an absolutely amazing um, piece of land, really exciting. So uh, this is just one example of um, things that are coming out of the woodwork. It just seems like there are so many local businesses um, with ideas who, who are wanting to do something positive, which is, which is really fantastic. Um, okay, I'm also 
got lots of experiments running. Um, I'm not sure I've got time to talk about them just now. Um, so I've already talked about the, um, the one with the barley, which is a bit of a mistake. I'm quite interested in the idea of sowing into um, overwinter stubble. Um, if anyone's interested in that idea, could I talk about it at the end? Um, and I've also been trialing um, some green hay cuts as well um, this year. Um, okay, so I think, I think I'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you do want to support what we're doing in any way, you can head over to our website. You can sign up for the newsletter. Um, I've also got lots of Christmas gift ideas on the website at the moment. Um, and I've also got a 10% discount at the moment. Um, there's a code nature21 that you can use. Um, okay, thank you so much. And I'm open to questions. Well, what a talk. Thank you, uh, Sally. Uh, thank you for this uh, very inspiring talk. Um, any any questions? I think we've got one, I think, from uh, Stan De Prato. Uh, A good, a good talk, uh, or it's more of a comment, I think, I, I see, like, you know, good talk, especially pointing out that annual mixes, which can do a good job of brightening up. Ooh. Um, Sorry, just uh, jumping around a bit. Um, uh, brightening up roundabouts, etc., are not wildflower meadows. And a uh, great project and really interesting talk. Thank you. I'm, I'm a writer and I'm currently researching a new guide book to less unknown places in the Lowlands. I would very much like to feature uh, Shalik. I'll be in touch. So that's, that's a great opportunity from Gillian Tate. Yes, yeah, definitely. Just, yeah. Go and have a look. Uh, a question here. So uh, are there any uh, areas of the wildflower meadow that you have not cut annually to see what happens? No, I've not. So there's the... That's from um, Annie MacLeod. Yeah, so. There's the area of Tusky grassland, which I obviously don't cut at all. And I would imagine that if I didn't cut the wildflower meadow, it would just revert to the same species composition. Um, as that tusky grassland, simply because um, there's such a high um, kind of seed rain of grasses from that um, tusky grassland that if I didn't continually cut it, I think that those grasses um, would just just take over. Um, it's mainly Yorkshire fog, which is um, quite quite an invasive grass. Um, so I think it would just revert to Yorkshire fog, basically. Great. Uh, if people want to mute and ask their questions uh, themselves, they can they can do so. Also, uh... can a perennial ryegrass field be overseeded to create a meadow? I think you'd have to do an awful lot of scarification and put in an awful lot of yellow rattle. So yellow rattle is one of these he hemiparasitic species um, that basically steals food from the grass. Um, so you'd probably for the first few years certainly have to have quite a high proportion of um, yellow rattle within your seed mix um, to get that started um, and it's probably cheaper to just hire a turf stripper to be honest and um, start again um, but it'd be quite an interesting experiment wouldn't it you never know Any other questions or are we okay to wind things up? Okay. But, uh, thanks again, uh, Sally, for this uh, inspiring talk. Uh, I really, I really quite simply liked to uh, loved your motivation. Um, your simple business model uh, was great and uh, I look forward to hearing maybe in the future about uh, whether your hypothesis holds that uh, mixed meadows have more to talk about. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that was very good. Um, so thank you everyone uh, for joining us um, uh, tonight and thanks again Sally. Uh, our next talk is on the 16th of December and this time we'll be uh, looking at the uh, various um, Scottish Wildlife Trust uh, Levians Reserves.
and we are mixing we're trying things a little bit differently there where we'll have a, a series of uh, of micro talks really just um, i think six or seven people will be talking about um we have the Levian's uh, reserve manager, who will be given a, an oversight of the all the of the Scottish Wildlife Trust meadows, uh, no reserve, sorry, in the Levians. But then there will be um, interventions from uh, the conveners of these reserves, given their own views and and <clears throat> are on 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 the reserve. So it will be it will be an interesting format, a different, slightly different format. So I hope you can you can join us. And uh, once again, uh, thanks, uh, Sally, and uh, good evening, everybody.